also. Please feel free to comment. Not less. Yeah, yeah. I hope do you have. Yeah, I, I hope ahead. I'm not talking. Somebody, somebody mentioned the issue of students themselves having barriers, and, and so I think one key area is empowerment, uh, empowering these yeah. uh, students with disabilities to know their capabilities and what they can achieve, and making them confident. One of the strategies we have adopted is to do outreaches to. Uh, inclusive schools and um, special schools, second cycle and even uh, fair cycle schools in Ghana. And so our team goes around um, to talk to some of these younger ones. And we often would go with um, um, our current students who are actually in the university, assessing university education to encourage them to know that there is a possible future in higher education for them. And that has worked uh, very well. Uh, um, and there, there was one instance of a student with hearing impairment that his teachers felt had potential, but thought that after second cycle school, he probably wouldn't have any future in higher education. But after our visit, uh, he, was, he was encouraged to enroll and he's now graduated uh, just last year. And so that's very empowering for him to know that he could access university education, that there was an office that was dedicated to meeting his needs. So I think that that is certainly an area that needs to be looked at, empowering these young people to know that they can access higher education and that there are people ready and willing to support them to do this, uh, um, and that there are policies in place that ensure that this is done. I think that is important. Um, Thank you. Any more? I think we haven't yet heard from Edna, uh, Ankoma, Sarumi, Peter. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, 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 some echo here. Yeah, what, what, what I'm looking at is, um, I mean, I know when students are applying for university um, admissions and things, they, they are all the statements and things put in whether they have any form of disability and all those um sort of helpful information I, i'm looking at um would it be very um necessary or very important to actually um see these students um uh, immediately like they come to the school or probably before coming a form of interview i know when you come to university of ghana you come to the college you know, before every student is admitted, we usually also have admission interview. And I think um, this could be an opportunity to actually uh, have experience with this student in person, even proud to um, having a full admission and seeing what is in place that could also help uh, such a student. I don't know whether this could be something that we could uh, also introduce, whether it's a good practice, I don't know. I'm just putting it across for us to have a thought about it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, for your points, and I hope there, there will be a reflection in the issue raised by Peter and others can bring. Yes, we're still waiting for comments. Like, uh, is it Taka, Taka, uh, Takako mentioned? Yes, it's Takako. Takako. I think Sarumi is trying to talk. 
Anyone, please go ahead. Hi. Hi. Yes. So I was thinking that it's also possible for um, the institutions to create or to encourage the creation of like a club for maybe um, hearing impaired students or visually impaired students so that together they can come together and feel encouraged and empower them as well within their campuses because maybe they may feel um, because of that disability they may feel um, you know lesser um, to other students so that's a great way to empower them also within their campuses as well i don't know if this is mentioned thank you, already. Yeah. Actually, actually, this uh, yeah, is thank you thank you Edna. i'm sorry yeah go ahead i'll go ahead. You, this is something that our students already do they have an association a campus association of students with special needs um, they have executive officers and they work, they have patrons and so they have, and they work together and we encourage them to also associate with the larger SRC. Um, and, and, and so there is already something like that, at least at the University of Ghana, where they, they really support one another. Um, um, and what Peter mentioned about a pre-interview admission, we do that at UG. Once you indicate that you have a disability when you're applying, your, your admission comes through a panel that actually assesses the level of your disability. We have doctors, uh, we have a doctor represented there and the, our office is represented and, 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 and then the other academic heads are represented where you are interested in studying. So we actually have this interaction with them um, before they are given admission. So we get to know the level of their disability. Uh, before they come. It looks like we are being pushed back into the other room. So, but I guess just, a, just a quick one. Yes, sir, Yes, I, I just want to fire from uh, Ms. Asidu, uh, the lab, how effective has it been? To I, I don't know if, if she can. Recording in progress. Please allow Ms. Uh, Ms. Asidu to conclude with what she was talking about. We really want to get the uh, completion of it. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, welcome back. So shall, shall we continue on uh, the group work reflections? Yes. Maybe I can, yeah. Maybe I can invite uh, to to start uh, with Laura. Yeah, um, uh, you you can um, uh, invite the note taker, or and you can support him or her as well to to reflect on the group discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, we were caught up with the time. We reflected on the two first questions and a bit of the third question. Um, uh, so, um, I will call up Isola was taking our notes. I not if he is ready, uh, then he can yep. uh, reflect on first and second question, and then I'll reflect on the third question. Go ahead, Isola. Yeah, okay, yes, I'm ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, one of the first things we discussed was to uh, look at, um, the aspects of uh, the marginalized communities in Africa. So each of the participants um, were asked to share their experiences, personal experiences uh, relating to being marginalized. And one of the experiences which we had was when uh, someone gave an example of a country like Nigeria and other African countries that if you are from a particular region, you cannot access education or you cannot be admitted to the university. For instance, in the 
southern parts of another part of Nigeria, if you live here from here, you cannot access education in the southern part because the northern part is designated as educationally less uh, less qualified communities. So even if you are intelligent enough to gain admission, you cannot secure admission in the southern part because you are considered to be from a marginalized community. And also there was an experience of being an albino, as was said earlier in general discussion, being discriminated by virtue of your skin, color, and your uh, community. And one cardinal point that was raised by Jean was um, those that are from low income communities, especially those that, uh, those that experience teenage pregnancy. Because coming from low income communities already means that you are disadvantaged. If you not get pregnant or you drop out of school due to some circumstance, then you are already marginalized altogether. So those from low income communities are still not able to access education in Africa by virtue of their economic uh, circumstance. So that was uh, the first thing that we discussed under that. And the second part we looked at was um, what each of our institution is doing to work on marginalized people. And then um, Laura talks about Kepler, that uh, Kepler in his admission process, he always ensure 50% in the agenda metrics, they always ensure 50% male, 50% female. And she also talked about the fact that as Kepler, they, one of the people that is their target as, as regarding marginalized people are those in refugee camp. And that 20, 25% of their admission process every year always go to those in refugee camp. In fact, they have a, a campus in the refugee community that serves the people that, that serves the refugees and the host community of those in the refugee camps too. So, and regarding that also, he also talked about the fact that in this lady, the last admission process, a large part of their, uh, they also admitted those who are living with physical disability in the admission. They are starting small, but they are really moving forward. And Lillian from Shortmore talked about treating, I will make those from marginalized community because we have talked about those marginalized, those marginalized. When we even bring them in, because they have been marginalized for so long, they are not able to fit into the community. So it's not just about bringing in marginalized people into, the, in, 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 into education. We must also ensure that we, are, we help them to adapt so that when, when we bring them in, they are able to fit in. That is one thing that uh, Lilian emphasized on. And also, Juni is talked about a university in Kenya ensuring gender equality by 50-50% for both male and female in their admission process. I think this was where we stopped before our time caught up with us. Laura, I don't know that you have something to rest. Thank you very much, Stella. So it was about oh, okay. uh, just um, a small uh, addition about the what we think the organization, our institution should do uh, to to promote DNI, um, Lillian said that if if she was about to revamp the program to support um, marginalized communities, we require it requires budget. So we need to make sure that budgets are allocated to the programs that we are intended to start, or the programs that we already have to make sure that uh, they they like the, the implementation is done smoothly. So thank you. We were able to discuss about those three questions, and we look forward to learn from the groups that we were able to discuss to all the four questions. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Dissane. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura, and appreciate uh, all the team members for the active um, um, participation engagement and for your great reflections. Uh, may I ask, um, Dina to identify uh, the note taker uh, to, to present uh, as well. Okay. Yes, um, we had Dr. Sola with us. Um, very, she's going to quickly run us through our notes. Let me share our screen, our notes, and then she will walk us through. Okay. Um, is this sharing, please? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I've been asked to present the uh, conversation and our key findings. Uh, if I miss anything, my group, you know, do drop in at the end. 
So we look at all the questions. What are the issues which have resonated with us in our group? We are looking at gender equality. We identify women in STEM is very, very important, especially as Africa is being positioned as a regional, especially on innovation and entrepreneurship. We need to develop our women in STEM. The issue of role model at the faculty level is very, very important for academics and mentoring the younger ones uh, and girls to rise up to be taking uh, STEM subjects starting from secondary school to university level. The point about statistics, the data on low representation was quite insightful and we feel this is actually an issue for higher institutions in Africa to take forward, starting from the vice chancellor, the vice chancellor's group to look at how female can be more represented you know so we want to increase we want to see that representation improving the need to address the low representation i've just mentioned that uh we need to look into that and that is quite important if you want to make our, our community and our nation uh, more representative linking i think leon mentioned something about sdg linking sdg to diversity and I think this is also very, very important. We see it as, you know, quite key in, especially in the agenda. I think she mentioned 2053, there about the priority for Africa. And again, this is quite important on energy, on you know, quality of education and so on. The need for intervention to promote women in STEM. Sorry if we are repeating the same thing, but this particular one is on scholarship. So giving scholarship to girls you know, to go to university and if we start from secondary school, the A levels, and then university to read STEM subjects, because we know that you know, finding money, finding for university education is a challenge. So one way of encouraging girls, you know, to take up STEM is by giving them scholarship. And I will add on to that by actually working closely with the industry, because we know that industry are also interested in raising STEM. Um, the point was mentioned about access to technologies, particularly during the COVID you know, the access to technology by our students and participation, especially doing online teaching. This is one area where we see a lot of marginalization. You know, many students that are working from, you know, improvised uh, low environments, not having technology. What is it that our higher education are doing to support them? I mean, for example, in the Western world, we provide a laptop, you know, for all this, for students, you know, so that they don't have any excuse of not being able to dial online for teaching. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we regard as our unique experiences in our various universities? We've broken this down to two main areas. So the African experience and the Western experience. So the African experience, um, we've, we had examples, case study from North University, the STEM program that they are currently doing, which is, again, focus, maybe the umbrella is quite narrow. So maybe this is one area of actually leveraging with other universities, you know, showcase what they are doing, let other universities know what they are doing so that we can learn. Uh, so it needs to be rolled out in other HE for increased access and we need more opportunities. So again, I think this is one good example to perhaps maybe showcase and working collaboratively with university that is already prom promoting STEM program in our universities. Also linked to that is the issue of enrollment for female students. So you are asking uh, unique experiences on having an affirmative and positive action for enrolling students into STEM program. Again, we are emphasizing on STEM because I think it's quite important. So the lower cutoff point, maybe to reduce it, but to give uh, more access to female students into STEM sub subjects. Public universities have what uh, the SH policies. I can't remember what that means again. Um, Dina, do you want to remind me? SH policies. Sexual harassment, I think. Okay, yes. sexual harassment. Sexual Thank, harassment you. Policy. Thank you. Okay, so our unique DIA experiences is that universities should have policy on harassment, bullying, and any aspect of sexual insult at our universities. This is quite important. And in the Western world, you know, we gave example of leadership program for women. This will help in developing pipeline for leadership in uh, various universities, as well as having DEI strategy, not just at the operational level, but at the university level. Next slide.
Next slide, please. Okay, so we now look at gender specific uh, priorities since we're looking at gender. So we agree that we want to see universities increasing women representation at all levels in the HEI. So the staff, at his professional support staff, faculty and students. The student is quite important because even at the Senate level, we should have student representation at the Senate level, you know, coming to dialogue and listening to what is happening at the institutional level so that they can take it to the student level to improve and to enhance their student experience. We have to remember that students have come without students, actually all of us will not be employed. So they are clients. And so having women representation that, you know, their voices have been heard at various levels is quite important. Promoting safe place for women to dialogue. You know, this has to deal with the confidence for women to come forward, discuss issues that relate to them on whether it's on sexual harassment, uh, insult and in harassment generally, but at least we should have a safe place where women can go to and discuss issues and concern. We also yeah. mentioned that investment. If, Roma, if you could wrap up. Um, yes, the next yeah. will be I think this is our last slide. So investment in faculty research for female researchers, which is very, very important because we want to build pipeline for, you know, professors, women professors. So this again, so by university investing, working closely with the government to invest in women researchers. Access in terms of space for accommodation and students, which provide a, a safety for our women to live on campus. Now, we also focus a lot on gender responsive policies. This will include providing facility for child, for, for women that are returning back to work to enable them to have facilities for child friendly environment for nursing parents, providing working environment, flexible working environment for women, but also paternity and maternity leave. It's not something that is common, but really the university should be pushing, not just for maternity leave, but also paternity leave. And I think that is our last slide, which we hope will provoke some areas for priority needs to take forward as action plan. Thank you. Thank you very much for our team. So we hand over. Yeah, thank you, thank Dr. You. Dr. Sola. We are very grateful. So um, that's from our group uh, on gender. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sola and uh, Dina as well. So, uh, Dr. Solomon, uh, would you like to invite uh, the note taker from your group to, re to present the reflections as well? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Destaling. So there are about seven to 10 participants and Peter is the one who is going to present. If there is an additional point, I will, I will come back. Peter, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Peter, we'll have some five minutes uh, overall uh, with reflections from us as well. Peter? Peter. Yeah, hello. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Peter. Yes. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think I went off there. Yeah, I think we also talking about higher education institutions and then the students with disability. Uh, in our group, I think there were some few questions and uh, which we tried to Deliberate on. And I think our first question came from Dr. Tekako, who is in our group, and it was about the education institution. And I think we had an answer from um, Dr. Wo, um, and uh, she came with a point that um, this is um, very uh, new, and uh, she talked about uh, actually from her experience, uh, uh, the University of Ghana is not including uh, students with uh, learning disability. And uh, she was talking about some important things which she included appropriate um, diagnosis for some of these uh, students. And um, she came to 
also <clears throat> mention about how some international students uh, however come to the school with a report and uh, uh, most of them have also undergone some assessment and for that matter um, uh, the institution actually know what is exactly um, uh, what exactly the student is going through and with such information we think we can actually uh, work with them and uh, she also talked about how University of Ghana have a way of assessing students uh, so that they can find ways of working with them accordingly. So with such information, um, she thinks um, progress is very slow, but we are moving from uh, one level to another. Uh, Dr. Solomon also came with an answer to Takeko's question. And he says students come from society of misconception. Yeah, wherever they come in from, they probably might not have adequate information about their condition. And um, he, he talked about how important it is for institutions also to uh, continue to monitor um, such students, especially when coming into uh, tertiary institutions where uh, responsibilities become even more than where in terms of learning and things of the roles of the student as compared to wherever they come in from. So he talked about the importance of monitoring such students. And um, some also talked that um, uh, at UG, this is not, um, there hasn't been much progress by a gradual sort of process. And um, there's a need to identify, I mean, case by case, and also try to work with such students, especially those with sort of multiple disability. So this is what um, uh, came from the question that was asked by Dr. Akeko on progress with students with disability. And we had another question from Helen that was about misconception, or sorry, about mindset on disability. And uh, Ellen was asking what has worked on changing mindset of people, you know, the successes. We wanted to hear our success stories about trying to change the mindset of people on uh, disability. Um, what came out, actually, an answer came from Dr. Mikeas, and uh, he stressed on orientation of inclusion, especially at uh, the University of Gonda. So he talked about more formalized programs, and uh, he said, for example, in vision and other forms of disability, and um, formalizing this pro program and trying to include the carers and the assistants, and also talking about uh, available devices and other equipment that could be used to assist such um, students, and also generally talk about inclusion. Uh, he also mentioned how um, assisting disability organizations also assist in this orientation um, programs. And um, he also talked about the institution trying to implement different services to make the university more inclusive. Uh, he said this is actually not, it also comes with some challenges when it comes to resources and funding of some of these um, uh, products or program, sorry. So, um, um, he, but the other thing he mentioned that was also great was trying to bring the students on board, especially students with disability, on board in all these um, programs. Uh, at the end, it's a, an issue of still learning and uh, hope to progress from where they are. Uh, uh, I will also try to um, 
throw more light on this question from Helen. And um, he talked about setting up of office, a special office to address issues um, with students with disability at the University of Ghana. And it's, she said this has been very helpful because this office sort of sees to everything concerning these students with uh, disability and it's it runs right from accommodation um, to lectures that's lecture halls and then um, sign interpreters to assist all these things are dealt with from that special office for students with disability and she also mentioned of the AT lab um, that has been very helpful with students, especially those with ear and vision. And uh, we also talked about um, alternate examination environment. All these things are organized by this special office. So we can see the, according to Dr. Wu, the special office has been very, very instrumental in working with students with disability. And even the office put up a policy statement, which was approved by the university and, uh, about four years ago, and uh, it has since been reviewed. Mm -hmm. So that's um, um, what came out from these two major questions. I think there was another question about barriers, student barriers. And, um, Thank you so oh. much, uh, Peter. Um, I'm, I'm, uh considering that time. Um, so thank you so much for um, the reflections from your group. Uh, I appreciate all the whole group for the hot discussion as we can see from the reflections. So before we wrap up, um, I'm forwarding uh, one um, uh, question for the panelists. Uh, maybe one of you can uh, uh, reflect. Uh, it's about inter uh, intersectionality. So how does uh, intersectionality of um, uh, the various, you know, diversity, equity, uh, inclusion areas um, present advantage for higher education institutions in implementing uh, DI strategies. Uh, can one of you uh, reflect on this, please, the panelists? Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. I would like to talk about intersectionality. So, intersectionality is a combination of uh, levels of marginality like one person subjected to many levels of, uh, of marginality. Let's say um, uh, being, being a, uh, a refugee is kind of being marginalized, but when you are a woman and living with disability in low income, this is a, a other uh, levels of uh, problems that are surrounding one person. So this is what we call intersectionality. So in our programs in higher learning institutions, we have been able uh, to identify the percentages of people we want to admit. Let's say, for instance, if we want to admit women and men, uh, but to some extent you find out that uh, men and women who are going to have access to our, our programs are from privileged families because they can pay their tuitions or because they, they can have supporters. So it is very important to think, even if we want to admit a thousand of students and we have 500 uh, women and 500 men, where are those people coming from? Are we really taking into consideration those women who are in rural areas? Are we considering men who come from low income levels? Are we uh, considering refugees? So having uh, reaching the quotas itself is not enough if we are not looking into, if we are not uh, assessing ourselves, how are we measuring the intersectionality of the students that we are serving? If we really want to promote the 40% uh, that we have under poverty, to move them at least to reduce that number to 10% uh, to or even to 0%, we need to make sure that we consider intersectionality. So in the strategies we put in place, let us have these quotas, but also make sure if we want to have 50% of women, where are we getting these 50% of women 
because if we do not consider this, we are only admitting or, or hiring women from privileged uh, environments. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Laura. Uh, just we're one minute away from uh, ending this call. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the, our panelists today um, uh, for their expert uh, reflections uh, on the questions we had on diversity, equity, uh, and uh, inclusion. I uh, also appreciate all the participants for the whole discussion you did uh, through the uh, group work, uh, as well as for joining us today for, for this special session. Um, the, the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, is really important in Africa, uh, and especially in African higher education. Uh, it's one of the uh, most neglected areas in many universities, um, not mentioning the universities who are really working well. And, uh, you know, uh, from the curriculum, you know, educational uh, teaching methods, uh, as well as, you know, campus facilities uh, where students and faculty do have a lot of uh, um, uh, issues. So this is a really uh, serious issues that uh, higher education institutions in Africa should address. Uh, not only in campus as well as, you know, in supporting the government in the development of uh, policies and uh, strategies. You know, African universities should work beyond, uh, you know, addressing the campus situation. Uh, it is, uh, you know, through research uh, uh, and education that, you know, the countries can improve the issues of diversity, equity and inclusion uh, in Africa. You know, we know that, you know, there are many, you know, more than like uh, for if you take Ethiopia, more than 17% of the population we had, you know, um, disability issues. So this is a very significant uh, population to address, uh, you know, the problem. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. You know, I appreciate uh, Shesi University and University of Gondar for this uh, collaborative um, uh, session. That's a very important session. And uh, once again, I would like to thank panelists as well as participants for, for the very fruitful uh, session today. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you Thank very you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Everyone that we're going to be taking a photo. Okay. So please turn okay. on your camera. Kindly turn on your camera because we're going to take a group photo before we go on to our next session. And as we're waiting for that, the next session is going to start at 1230 GMT continuing on this conversation and the topic is institutional assessment on diversity equity and inclusion so i think it'll be a great build up based on what we've already done here okay so let me just wait for a few more seconds for people to turn on their videos please turn on your camera so we can see you Nice to see everybody's faces. Okay, I see a few people trying to still get on. So let me just wait 10 more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and smile. And David, please take the photo. Just keep on smiling. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you. We will see you at the next session. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>